I'm Dr. Khalid Shebi, Director of the Cardiac Center at the King Fahad Armed Forces Hospital here in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. The COVID-19 COVID pandemic has challenged our routine clinical practice pathways. Many centers over the world were forced to adopt new policies to ensure the safety of healthcare workers and other patients without interrupting guideline-directed management. To achieve that, it's important to recognize that there are different levels of infection control depending on the stage of the pandemic a country is actually facing. During the crisis phase, elimination of the hazard completely by deferring non-emergent cases and cancelling elective cases is the most effective control measure, followed by engineering controls and system administrative controls, and finally, the availability of personal protective equipment. This is an educational overview of the preparation of the catheterization laboratory and the cardiac operating room during the COVID-19 pandemic for the American College of Cardiology Interventional Council. Today I'll be interviewing Dr. Mirfat al Asnaj, Director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory here at the King Fahad Armed Forces Hospital, and Dr. Walid Abu Khder, Head of Cardiac Surgery at our hospital, to discuss their setups during this pandemic. First of all, Dr. Lassner, what changes have you implemented to your usual protocols when transporting and receiving COVID uh, positive or suspected COVID cases uh, to the cardiac catheterization laboratory? So patients are transported to the catheterization laboratory wearing a surgical mask via the shortest predetermined route within the hospital using uh, elevators that have been dedicated for transport of COVID positive patients and appropriately labeled as such. Now transport usually happens with the minimal number of staff uh, and the staff are of course wearing the personal protective equipment which consists of a surgical mask, gown and gloves. For critically ill patients who require ventilation or mechanical support, they may need a larger number of staff to accompany them during the transportation. And for these critically ill patients, we've lowered our threshold to intubate them prior to transportation to the cath lab to avoid exposure of the personnel in the catheterization laboratory. In such cases, cases the intubation happens in the intensive care unit in a negative pressure room by a single experienced anesthetist with appropriate uh, full protection and using videoscopic guidance prior to transportation. Once the patient is transported, that happens using a portable ventilator again uh, with minimal number of staff as much as possible and that prevents aerosolization that happens with the AMBO bagging. Uh, Dr. Abu Khadir, uh, do you have anything else to add that is done differently regarding to uh, accepting cases for surgery or uh, transporting them once they are accepted and receiving them in the cardiac OR uh, that is different from what has already been described by Dr. Lasnaj? Well, uh, we really consider non-operative management whenever possible and uh, we try to avoid emergency procedure during uh, uh, weekends or uh, off hours uh, since there is less expert staff around. Uh, and uh, we try to obtain uh, an RNA uh, PCR for COVID-19 uh, 24 hours before the procedure. Uh, in terms of uh, induction and transportation, we follow the same principles that were mentioned by Dr. Uh, Lasnaj. Patient is intubated uh, and, uh, and ventilated in a negative room in the ICU. And then after a period of uh, 20 to 30 minutes where all the aerosolized particle has settled down, the patient is moved through the shortest route through the corridors full of uh, caution uh, uh, signs for COVID-19 and uh, taken uh, to the operating room. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Alassane, the patient has left the intensive care unit, has now arrived here in front of the cardiac catheterization laboratory. Have you made any changes to how the patient accesses the lab? Yes, we no longer use the dedicated uh, entrance to the cath lab. We bypass that entrance because we bypass the recovery and receiving area. And the patient is admitted directly to the designated cath lab for COVID patients using this entrance over here uh, through the shortest route into the lab. Okay, Dr. Alastair, we're in the dedicated COVID lab now. Uh, can you tell us what changes you have made uh, to the lab and to the preparation process to receive the patient? 
So when the patient arrives to the lab, the staff are already ready. They've already donned their protective equipment. Uh, there's a dedicated area for that where they do it in the ante room and uh, they put on their lead and they come into the lab. So, and they open the, they prepare the lab, they have the supplies that they need, the catheters, the wires, uh, the medications have already been drawn up. So when the patient actually physically comes to the lab, the staff is already ready to receive them. Upon arrival to the lab, the patient and their belongings, including the stretcher, remains in the lab. Now this is contrary to what we normally do. We usually take the stretcher out to create adequate room. But we've chosen to keep everything that belongs to the patient in the catheterization laboratory, and we've worked out a system where we have enough space for the crash cart uh, if need be. In terms of the lab itself, what we've done is we've stripped it down completely, removed all unnecessary equipment and all unnecessary consoles, including intravascular ultrasound, OCTs, rotablators, uh, intra-aortic balloon pumps, and so on. Those have all been removed completely from the laboratory. We have a labeled box in the control room that has the most commonly used uh, supplies that we're going to need, such as the common sizes of the, catheter, of the stents and balloons and wires that can be handed in for uh, the procedure itself. In terms of the staffing, as you can see, we still try to keep it minimal as possible. So all trainees and fellows uh, are not admitted to these cases. In the lab itself, in full protective equipment is the operator with a scrub nurse and the radiographer. In the control room, prepped and, and already uh, in their protective equipment is the circulating nurse and the cardiovascular technologist. When we need them, they come into the room. Otherwise, they remain in the control area with a closed door while the procedure is ongoing. The lab itself, the one that we have chosen, as we mentioned earlier, we chose the lab that had the shortest entry route and furthest away from uh, the remainder of the labs. In addition to that, it is very important that you communicate with your uh, uh, engineering department and see if your cath lab is uh, uh, negative pressure or not. If it can be converted to negative pressure, good and well. If not, you will have to function with a positive pressure cath lab with a HEPA filter and potentially uh, use some UV rays for that. Uh, at that point, you need to look at the air changes per hour and try to optimize them. Again, uh, recommended is to do that with your engineering department and with the infection control. Okay, Dr. Alasnaj, uh, many places all over the world now are cr coming out of their crisis and lockdown uh, phases and uh, starting to uh, resume or think about resuming normal uh, cardiovascular services. Uh, what are you doing in this regard? In the re reboot phase, it is critical that we continue to adhere to the infection control policies that the hospital uh, um, implemented. But it's equally important that we are very selective and we plan the procedures that we're going to bring into the cath lab. So planning a minimalistic procedure involving the personnel, the least amount of personnel that you need. So for example, a TAVR procedure, involve the anesthetist early on, strategize what kind of anesthesia will be administered, how many staff members need to be in the case, and have the uh, equipment and supplies ready just just as we do right now. So all the necessary equipment are prepped and ready in the lab, the backup supplies are available in the control room, and we pr proceed accordingly with the minimum number of staff that is reasonable and to safely uh, perform the procedure. Okay, Dr. Alasnaj, the uh, procedure is now concluded. Uh, how do you go about uh, recovering uh, the patient post-procedure? Is it business as usual? No, absolutely not. We no longer use the recovery area where the patient is monitored. The patient is recovered in the same designated cath lab where the procedure was performed. And once the patient is deemed stable enough for transportation, they're transported with the uh, minimum amount of staff uh, to accompany the patient through the same route that they arrived in. Now, in terms of the catheterization laboratory itself, the staff that were there, they undergo the doffing process in a designated area area in the ante room and that's where our lead aprons remain and the boots and so on and we try not to contaminate the remainder of the catheterization laboratory. The lab itself once the patient has left undergoes terminal cleaning which includes the lab itself and the control room and whoever performs it uh, follows standard procedure where they're also uh, uh, donning uh, appropriate PPEs. There. How have you prepared the cardiac OR and staffed it to receive COVID-positive patients? 
Well, uh, it's very important in terms of uh, staff to minimize the number of uh, staff in the operating room and uh, to have uh, the, the, the most expert uh, people around you to, to be uh, efficient and, uh, and to minimize the risk of exposure. Uh, the second thing, uh, it's important also to have a senior assistant in the operating room uh, to help and avoid junior staff and medical students in the operating room again to minimize the number of exposure. And before starting the procedure, we discussed the plan and we discussed the most uh, effective and most efficient procedure to get a, a, a rapid operation without uh, breaking the techniques and, uh, and uh, increase the risk of uh, exposure to, uh, to the room. Uh, it's also important to minimize the circulation of the staff in the, in the room, to minimize the turbulence of the air that might uh, increase the risk of aerosolization. And uh, we do that by uh, design designating one uh, single uh, entrance and exit door, uh, trying to keep the door closed all the time and, and uh, to avoid the breaks or relief of staff unless it's really uh, necessary uh, during the procedure. In terms of the operating room itself, we try to, to minimize the items and uh, the equipment in the operating room to the necessary items in the operating room. Uh, and Dr. Abu how have you selected which of your operating rooms is going to be the designated uh, COVID uh, operating room and how have you physically set it up? Uh, per principle, uh, we choose the, the closest operating room to the, uh, to the door, uh, so we uh, bypass the recovery area and all the other operating room to, to minimize the exposure of the staff. Uh, so it's a, it's a straight shot from the door to the operating room. And uh, as soon as we arrive to the operating room, all the staff are uh, ready in the operating room wearing all the PPEs and the protective uh, measures uh, for the uh, risk of infection. Uh, the operating room, as you said, in principle is a positive room and uh, the surrounding anti-rooms are uh, negative. Okay, Dr. Uh, Abu Khdar, we're in the cardiac OR now. Do you have any particular areas of concern that you would like to point out regarding the potential for contamination or aerosolization that may occur during open heart surgery? And what mitigation techniques uh, do you advise or have you de uh, deployed? Um, yes, uh, we have to uh, keep in consideration uh, several uh, pitfalls or several uh, steps of the procedure where there is a risk of uh, aerosolization of, b of blood and uh, body fluid uh, during the surgery. Uh, and uh, the first one being during uh, performing the sternotomy, if you are using the oscillating saw or even the regular saw, that uh, would create some aerosolization of uh, uh, blood and, uh, and body fluid. Uh, the second, uh, so the second thing is during using the electrocautery, and uh, when you are using electrocautery, can uh, cause evaporation and uh, aerosolization of uh, uh, of uh, particles, and we overcome that by using a special electrocautery with a suction uh, device. Uh, a third point uh, will be during uh, using uh, a high uh, negative uh, suction uh, and uh, or using an open suction technique and that's why we try to reduce the, the amount of uh, the, the, the suctioning, the negativity of the suction and we use a closed uh, suction uh, technique device and it's also possible if you have an open suction technique to use a, a filter on the suction. Uh, the third uh, or the fourth uh, uh, risk is uh, during uh, using the, the CO2 for, um, for de-airing or using the CO2 blo blower during uh, coronary surgery or uh, using a CO2 insufflation during thoracotomy or during uh, endoscopic procedure that also would increase the risk of aerosolization so we try to avoid using CO2. Uh, any injury to the lung during the procedure will also increase the risk of aerosolization and uh, splash of blood or, or body fluid uh, on the surgeon or on the, on the staff, that is also a risk of aerosolization. So it is important to try to, 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 to make the, the, the technique as simple as possible to avoid uh, the risk of contamination. Dr. Abu Khader, as we wind down here, is there any other advice you'd like to give that we haven't already uh, mentioned uh, regarding uh, uh, open heart surgery uh, and the operating room. Uh, 
Well, there are uh, several technical points that are uh, important to mention, and one of them is related to the to the surgeon himself uh, wearing the N95 respirator and uh, wearing the protective eye shield uh, would affect the clarity of, of the loops and uh, would create fogs on the loops. So it's important to use some anti-fog uh, solution on the loops and to adjust the loops before the operation and, and fix them properly while wearing the N95. Uh, also fixing the, the, the headlight uh, before putting all the protective gears, it's important to, to fix it in a such a way that it does not interfere with the protective gears uh, during surgery. Uh, the second uh, point that uh, I would like to mention is the terminal cleaning of the oper operating room. So after the patient leaves the operating room, the OR should remain uh, closed for an appropriate standoff uh, period uh, of time. And this uh, standoff period of time really depends on the size of the operating room, uh, on the length of the procedure, and on the air cycle uh, per hour in, in the operating room and uh, there are uh, readily and easily accessible information on the CDC website uh, to calculate the appropriate uh, standoff period of time. Uh, and uh, last but not least uh, is, is the post-operative recovery. The patient should be uh, moved out of the operating room to a negative room in the ICU and again stick to the principle of minimizing the staff exposure. So we minimize the number of uh, lab tests done, we minimize the number of imaging done uh, so that uh, we don't expose the staff to this uh, risk. Uh, and uh, also it's very important that all the staff in the ICU would be wearing the, the appropriate uh, protection devices. Thank you very much, it's been very informative. Thank you.